This is the book of Abraham, a part of the scriptures used today by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the Mormons. But where did this book come from? Joseph Smith, founder of the Mormon Church, claimed to translate it from an ancient Egyptian scroll he purchased from a traveling antiquities dealer in 1835. Smith claimed the scroll contained a lost book of Abraham, an original text nearly 4,000 years old. At the time in America, no one could read ancient Egyptian, but today, Egyptologists know exactly what it says. So what was this ancient scroll? Was it a lost book of Abraham? Or was it something else? Stay tuned and find out for yourself. Imagine yourself here in Kirtland, Ohio in 1835. You're in the Western Reserve. The people are farmers, blacksmiths, and millers, and about 25% are part of a fledgling community known as the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the Mormons. Joseph Smith and his followers came to Kirtland in early 1831. And though the people are poor, they've begun construction on an elaborate new temple. Joseph was a young man, but he was able to inspire people, generate enthusiasm, and raise money. The temple was expensive and took a great sacrifice on the part of the people to build. But now Joseph needs to raise some more money. And what he wants to buy may surprise you. A traveling antiquities dealer named Michael H. Chandler has come to town peddling his wares. An exhibit of, of all things, four Egyptian mummies. It was a spectacle. For a small price, you could see fragments of mysterious writings. Things from ancient Egypt. Even real mummified human corpses. All of which had been on earth since Bible times. Chandler and his exhibit were always able to draw a crowd. The four mummies were the main drawing card, but several prominent brethren of the Mormon church became even more intrigued by the scrolls with mysterious ancient writing, Egyptian writing. Five years earlier, Joseph Smith, their prophet and leader, had published the Book of Mormon, a remarkable work in that Joseph said he had not actually authored the book, but rather he had translated it from the records of an ancient pre-Columbian civilization. Joseph said an angel appeared to him, an angel named Moroni, who presented Joseph with a set of gold plates. The plates were said to have been inscribed with a mysterious language called Reformed Egyptian. The story is that Joseph Smith translated the gold plates by the gift and power of God. But Joseph said he was required to return the plates to the angel after completing his translation, so they are not available for independent examination. When the Book of Mormon was published in 1830, it established Joseph Smith as a prophet and seer in the eyes of his followers. Joseph had brought forth one volume of lost scripture, and they believed God would use him to restore other lost scriptures. One of the original appeals, I think, of early Mormonism was Joseph Smith's claim to be a prophet, seer, and revelator. Uh, he had promised that the Lord was opening up the bowels of the earth and bringing forth ancient scriptures and would continue to do so because we were living in the last days of the earth. 
When Michael Chandler arrived in Kirtland with ancient papyrus scrolls covered with mysterious unknown writings, the saints wondered if their prophet could decipher these records. What happened was the enthusiasm was there for the members of the church to think that these things had tremendous value, that the Lord indeed was bringing to the prophet Joseph Smith these documents for him to translate. Joseph said that he could indeed decipher these scrolls. In fact, he said these were more than just ancient Egyptian artifacts. These were none other than the writings of Abraham and Joseph, famous figures from the Old Testament of the Bible. If this were true, these scrolls would be an unprecedented and momentous discovery, a preservation of writings from 2,000 years before Christ. But what were they really? Stay tuned as we investigate a remarkable Mormon claim, the rediscovery of a lost book of Abraham. <laughs> The story begins in 1833 in the eastern United States when a man named Michael Chandler was commissioned to sell a collection of ancient Egyptian antiquities. The collection included 11 mummies, two papyrus scrolls, and several scroll fragments. The artifacts had originally been exhumed by a tomb raider named Antonio Lobolo in the early 1820s from a burial site along the banks of the Nile River near the Egyptian city of Thebes. After Lobolo's death, his estate shipped the artifacts to New York City, hoping they could be sold for a profit. Chandler's travels with the antiquities included stops in Philadelphia, Baltimore, and Harrisburg, where he was able to sell seven of the mummies. He arrived in Cleveland in March of 1835 with the papyrus scrolls and four remaining mummies. An article in the Cleveland Advertiser newspaper of March 26, 1835, noted Chandler's interest in selling his remaining artifacts. The exhibitor permits as free an examination of them as is consistent with their preservation. Specimens of the ancient method of writing on papyrus found with the mummies are also shown by Mr. Chandler, whose intelligent conversation adds much to the interest of the exhibition. The collection is offered for sale by the proprietor. Cleveland Advertiser, March 26, 1835. Michael Chandler had, was apparently acting as an agent for several businessmen in Philadelphia. And apparently the arrangement was that he was supposed to um, display and sell these antiquities as he displayed them and keep a small commission for himself and send the remainder of the money back to the businessmen in Philadelphia. Once he was out on the road, he apparently lost contact with his businessmen and was uh, dispensing of these antiquities as he went and keeping the entire profit for himself. He had heard about Joseph Smith, the Mormon prophet, and his abilities to uh, translate languages, and so he wended his way to Kirtland, Ohio, and arrived there in July of 1835. Chandler's arrival in Kirtland was described at the time by William W. Phelps, a member of the Mormon community in a letter to his wife. Four Egyptian mummies were brought here. There were two papyrus rolls besides some other ancient Egyptian writings with them. As no one could translate these writings, they were presented to President Smith. He soon knew what they were and said they, the rolls of papyrus, contained the sacred record of Joseph in Pharaoh's court in Egypt and the teachings of Father Abraham. God has so ordered it that these mummies and writings have been brought into the church. July 20, 1835. That created a tremendous value for these papyri. But Chandler was unwilling to sell the papyri by themselves. That was all that the prophet was interested in. Uh, he insisted on selling the four mummies that were all that were left now and everything. He was ready now to unload the entire uh, collection of antiquities that he had left. Remember, this is a movement that is sort of the religion of the book squared because not only is it the religion of the book in the, the Old and New Testament but the Book of Mormon as well. So there has to be a real concern about texts. Text, text, text. And so text would appear even to the ordinary citizen of Kirtland, I would think, as much more critical than the mummies. His selling price was $2,400, which was an extreme sum in those days. Smith didn't have it, 
but since these were such valuable documents, Smith used two other people to invest sums of money, and uh, they did, and Chandler sold these uh, antiquities to Joseph Smith, and that's how he came into possession of them. Joseph Smith said that to properly translate these scrolls would take some time, but that a few of the Egyptian characters were recognizable to him immediately, and he translated these for Chandler. Chandler thanked him profusely and supplied an affidavit endorsing Smith's scholarship. This is to make known to all who may be desirous concerning the knowledge of Mr. Joseph Smith in deciphering the ancient Egyptian hieroglyphic characters in my possession, which I have in many eminent cities showed to the most learned. And from the information that I could ever learn or meet with, I find that of Mr. Joseph Smith to correspond in the most minute matters. Translation of the papyri commenced almost at once, with Joseph focusing his attention on one of the papyrus scrolls, which he identified as an ancient record of Abraham. I have commenced the translation of some of the characters, or hieroglyphics, and much to our joy have found that one of the rolls contained the writings of Abraham, another with the writings of Joseph of Egypt, a more full account of which will appear in its place. As I proceed to examine or unfold them. Truly we can say, the Lord is beginning to reveal the abundance of peace and truth. July 5, 1835. It was a remarkable claim. Could these papyri actually be the writings of Abraham, the patriarchal father of the Jewish, Christian, and Islamic religions? Did Joseph Smith really have the ability or inspiration to translate ancient Egyptian? And could these scrolls be what Joseph Smith claimed they were? In the weeks immediately after purchasing the scrolls, Joseph threw himself enthusiastically into the task of translation. He records in his diary that he began by developing an alphabet and grammar of the Egyptian language. The townspeople were duly impressed with the work, and scores of visitors would call on the prophet to see for themselves these wondrous things. I was continually engaged in translating an alphabet of the Book of Abraham and arranging a grammar of the Egyptian language as practiced by the ancients. July, 1835. In the afternoon, I waited on most of the twelve apostles in my house and exhibited to them the ancient records and gave explanations. This day passed off with the blessing of the Lord. October 3, 1835. In 1835 in America, there was no one who could read ancient Egyptian. All knowledge of the language had been lost for centuries. Only recently had the French scholar Jean-Francois Champollion made a breakthrough in deciphering the ancient Egyptian language. The Rosetta Stone, a trilingual inscription in Greek, Egyptian hieroglyphic, and Demotic, was the key which allowed Champollion to unlock ancient Egyptian. But his work was far away from the pioneers of rural Ohio. In the 1840s in the United States, the ancient Egyptian language was virtually unknown. It had only been deciphered beginning in 1822, and that knowledge sim simply had not crossed the Atlantic, so that almost any interpretation given to an Egyptian document in 1842 or 45 or 50 or even 1860 would have been believable to a general audience who would have no way of comparing it with the actual truth. But in his diary, Joseph Smith confidently records doing what no scholar in America in his day could do, translating ancient Egyptian scrolls. This afternoon, I labored on the Egyptian alphabet in company with brothers Oliver Cowdery and W.W. W. Phelps. And during the research, the principles of astronomy, as understood by Father Abraham and the ancients, unfolded to our understanding, the particulars of which will appear hereafter. October 1, 1835. This afternoon, I recommenced translating from the ancient records. October 7, 1835. I returned home and spent the day in translating the Egyptian records. A warm and pleasant day. November 19, 1835. 
spent the forenoon instructing those that called to inquire concerning the things of God in the last days. And in the afternoon, we translated some of the Egyptian records. November 24, 1835. Spent the day translating. November 25, 1835. At home, we spent the day in transcribing Egyptian characters from the papyrus. I'm severely afflicted with a cold. November 26, 1835. Uh, Joseph Smith, in his diary of July 1835, talked specifically about translating characters or hieroglyphics and finding that it was about one was about Abraham and one was about Joseph. So there was a book of Abraham and there's a book of Joseph. He, with a couple of his scribes, uh, began working on an alphabet and grammar of the Egyptian language. And we have uh, documents, uh, some of which, or one of which, was written by Joseph Smith himself with uh, some additions by Oliver Cowdery and another one in the handwriting of uh, William W. Phelps. And, and then um, we have, in addition, some remarks made or small additions made in the handwriting of Warren Parrish. Through the autumn and early winter of 1835, Joseph continued to work on the project. And eventually, the mummies and the scrolls were moved to an upper floor room here at the Kirtland Temple, where Joseph continued to work on the translation. But the translation project soon tapered off, and Joseph moved on to other matters related to leading his community. He established his own bank in Kirtland and issued his own currency. But in 1838, when the venture went bankrupt, Joseph fled Kirtland on horseback in the middle of the night and never returned. In 1839, the Mormon community relocated to a small town on the banks of the Mississippi River known as Commerce, Illinois. Joseph renamed the town Nauvoo, a Hebrew word meaning beautiful. I mean, it was a place with two or three... I mean, a few houses and t two stores, I think. It was just a little tiny wide spot in the road, but it was located on a really pretty bluff. It was, I mean, there were, what, maybe 20 people there, 25, 30, and it became the largest town in Illinois within five years. In Nauvoo, Joseph would achieve his greatest fame. He was the mayor of the town and had his own militia of nearly 3,000 men. At the time, the U.S. military totaled less than 9,000. And there was even a movement underway to nominate Joseph for the presidency of the United States. It was in Nauvoo that Joseph finally published his translation of the Abraham Scroll. It first appeared in 1842 in three installments of a Mormon newspaper called The Times and Seasons. It was called The Book of Abraham, and a note at the beginning introduced it as a translation of some ancient records that have fallen into our hands from the catacombs of Egypt, purporting to be the writings of Abraham while he was in Egypt, called The Book of Abraham, written by his own hand upon papyrus. Today, the Book of Abraham is included in a volume of Mormon scripture called The Pearl of Great Price. It is considered inspired scripture by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, of equal authority to the Bible. The Book of Abraham includes a creation story, but it's dramatically different than the biblical creation story found in the Book of Genesis. Where the Bible points to one true creator God, the Book of Abraham recounts a startling new twist. And then the Lord said, Let us go down. And they went down at the beginning, and they, that is the gods, organized and formed the heavens and the earth. Book of Abraham, chapter 4, verse 1. And the gods said among themselves, On the seventh time we will end our work, which we have counseled, and we will rest on the seventh time from all our work which we have counseled. And the gods concluded upon the seventh time, because that on the seventh time they would rest from all their works, which they, the gods, counseled among themselves to form, and sanctified it. And thus were their decisions at the time that they counseled among themselves to form the heavens and the earth. Book of Abraham, chapter 5, verses 2 and 3. Judaism and Christianity have always been monotheistic religions. Uh, there's one God. Uh, there's one Creator. And if he had a council, it was a council of created angelic beings that did his bidding by his sovereign authority. 
And the idea of equally co-eternal beings working with him on a group project uh, is totally unprecedented in Jewish and Christian teaching. Joseph Smith announced that he would publish additional installments of his Book of Abraham, but he never did. And in June of 1844, he was assassinated. And a group of Mormon dissidents published a newspaper called the, Mor the Nauvoo Expositor, which accused Joseph Smith as mayor of taking too much uh, into his own hands. And there, was, there were some references in the Nauvoo Expositor to the notion of plural marriage. And, and so as mayor, he sent the constabulary to destroy the newspaper. And the governor brought him into Carthage, Illinois, and put him in jail. And then the governor turned his back and took the militia and went to um, Nauvoo, leaving the jail unprotected. And then other militia with blackened faces came in and shot him. On June 27, 1844, his cell was stormed. Joseph was shot, and as he fell from a second floor window, he was fired upon numerous times. No one was ever convicted for his brutal murder. In 1846, under the leadership of Brigham Young, the Mormons made their historic trek from Nauvoo to the Great Salt Lake Valley. At the time, this was isolated frontier territory, far from the jurisdiction of the U.S. government. And though Joseph Smith was no longer leading the Mormons, his Book of Mormon, Doctrine and Covenants, and Pearl of Great Price, including the Book of Abraham, all became canon, inspired scriptures on par with the Old and New Testaments of the Bible. They are the basis for the unique theology of the Church of Jesus Christ Latter-day Saints to this day. In the Great Salt Lake Valley, the Mormons once again proved their ability to settle frontier territory and build a thriving town. They began work on another temple, their greatest yet. But the scroll Joseph Smith had identified as a lost book of Abraham remained in Illinois, in the possession of Joseph's mother, Lucy Mack Smith, and his widow, Emma. In 1856, twelve days after Lucy's death, Emma Smith who now seemed to have ambivalent feelings about her late husband, sold the papyri to a man named Abel Combs. Emma, now remarried to a man named Louis C. Biderman, provided an affidavit attesting that the antiquities had belonged to Joseph. This certifies that we have sold to Mr. A. Combs four Egyptian mummies with the records of them. They were purchased by the Mormon prophet Joseph Smith at the price of $2,400 in the year 1835. They were highly prized by Mr. Smith on account of the importance which attached to the record, which was accidentally found enclosed in the breast of one of the mummies. Emma Smith Biderman, May 26, 1856. One of the things that, that is really interesting about Emma Smith, she was very much engaged in the process of forgetting as well as remembering because she, she has to forget that he introduced plural marriage into Mormonism. She, even though we know that she was at some of these ceremonies where he married other women, women that were friends of his, friends of hers, and her husband married them as well, she told her sons that it was Brigham Young that introduced plural marriage into Mormonism. Two of the mummies sold to Abel Combs were later acquired by a Chicago museum that was destroyed in the Great Chicago Fire of 1871. It was assumed that the Joseph Smith papyri had also been destroyed, lost forever to the emerging knowledge of Egyptology. From early on, non-Mormons were dubious of Joseph's claim to have recovered a book written by Abraham 2,000 years before Christ and lost for nearly 4,000 years. A man named William West, 
who visited the Mormons in Kirtland and viewed Joseph Smith's Egyptian scrolls, expressed his doubts in an 1837 pamphlet. Is it possible that a record written by Abraham containing the most important revelations that God ever gave to man should be entirely lost by the tenacious Israelites and preserved by the unbelieving Egyptians and by them embalmed and deposited in the catacombs with an Egyptian priest? I venture to say no. It is not possible. It is more likely that the records are Egyptian. In 1859, a French Egyptologist named Theodule de Veria provided the first scholarly evaluation of the Book of Abraham. The focus of de Veria's critique was three illustrations or facsimiles that Joseph Smith copied from the Egyptian scrolls and published as part of his Book of Abraham. Below each of the facsimiles, Joseph provided his explanations of their meanings. According to Joseph, facsimile one depicts an idolatrous priest about to slay Abraham on an altar. The scene is specifically referred to in the text of the book itself. And it came to pass that the priests laid violence upon me, that they might slay me also, as they did those virgins upon this altar. And that you may have a knowledge of this altar, I will refer you to the representation at the commencement of this record. Book of Abraham, chapter 1, verse 12. But Deveria noticed that there was something wrong with the pictures. They closely resembled scenes he had come across numerous times in common Egyptian burial documents. But Smith, according to Deveria, had completely misidentified the characters and the scenes. In facsimile 1, Smith labeled the standing figure on the left as a priest, knife in hand, attempting to slay Abraham. In reality, said Deveria, this is the Egyptian god Anubis, assisting the resurrection of a deceased Egyptian. Anubis was also drawn incorrectly. He should have been pictured with the head of a jackal, not the head of a man. The god Anubis, who should have a jackal said, effecting the resurrection of Osiris. Théodule de Veria, 1859. You would never imagine, as an Egyptologist, that the god, the black god on the left, of this uh, scene had anything but a jackal's head. That's just normal. Joseph Smith had explained another of the illustrations in the Book of Abraham called Facsimile 3 as Abraham, seated on Pharaoh's throne, lecturing the royal court on matters of astronomy. But again, Deverius said Joseph's explanation was completely wrong. Facsimile 3 was also a rendition of a common scene from Egyptian burial documents depicting a deceased man being led into the presence of Osiris, the Egyptian god of the underworld. The deceased led by Matt into the presence of Osiris. His name is Horus, as may be seen in the prayer which is addressed to the divinities of the four cardinal points. Théodule de Veria, 1859. Joseph said the characters above the man's hand identify him as Shulam, in actuality, the hieroglyphics give his name, Horus. There is no mention of Shulam at all. The various initial analysis of facsimile 3 is accurate. It is the result of the judgment scene in which the deceased Horus is being brought into the presence of Osiris. In the year 1912, Franklin S. Spaulding, the Episcopal Bishop of Utah, brought a new round of scrutiny to the Book of Abraham when he asked eight noted scholars of Egyptology to evaluate the three facsimiles. To a man, they agreed that Joseph's explanations were erroneous. It is difficult to deal seriously with Joseph Smith's impudent fraud. Smith has turned the goddess Isis into a king and Osiris into Abraham. A. H. Sace, Oxford University. These three facsimiles of Egyptian documents in the Pearl of Great Price depict the most common objects in the mortuary religion of Egypt. Joseph Smith's interpretation of them as part of a unique revelation through Abraham, therefore, very clearly demonstrates that he was totally unacquainted with the significance of these documents and absolutely ignorant of the simplest facts of Egyptian writing and civilization. Dr. James H. Preston, University of Chicago. The Egyptian papyrus, which Smith declared to be the Book of Abraham and translated or explained in his fantastical way, and of which three specimens are published in the Pearl of Great Price, 
are parts of the well-known Book of the Dead. And although the reproductions are very bad, one can easily recognize these familiar scenes. Dr. Edward Meyer, University of Berlin. The New York Times took note of Spaulding's findings and issued a blistering two-page expose on the Book of Abraham in its December 29, 1912 edition. The Mormon Church could not remain silent in the face of this withering attack on the credibility of Joseph Smith and the Book of Abraham. It offered assurances to the faithful in a 1913 article in its monthly magazine, The Improvement Era. The author, Professor John Henry Evans, argued that it wasn't fair to judge the credibility of Joseph's book by only reviewing the reproduced facsimiles. Evans insisted that to do any reasonable critique would require access to the original documents themselves. Now, as a matter of fact, the hieroglyphics submitted to the scholars constitute less than one-seventh of the Book of Abraham, and that only an accompaniment of the text. The question, therefore, becomes, is anyone justified in drawing a conclusion respecting an entire manuscript from a statement which was made with respect to only a very small part of that manuscript before they would be warranted in saying that the entire book of Abraham was not properly translated they would have to examine the original papyrus or a copy of it John Henry Evans Improvement Era February 1913 but the original Joseph Smith papyri were gone almost surely destroyed in the Great Chicago Fire of 1871. Or were they? But in the spring of 1966, a dramatic discovery was made right here in New York at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Dr. Aziz Atiyah, a professor of Arabic studies from the University of Utah, was here doing research when he was approached by the curator of the museum's department of Egyptian antiquities, Dr. Henry G. Fisher. Fisher made a startling announcement. The museum had in its archives 11 papyrus fragments that had once belonged to Joseph Smith. Fisher didn't know how the Mormon church leaders would respond to this news, and he was looking for an intermediary. He wondered if Dr. Atiyah, a respected non-Mormon from Salt Lake City, could ask the Mormon church leaders if they would be interested in acquiring the papyri. Negotiations between the Metropolitan Museum and the Mormon church proceeded, and on November 27, 1967, the museum presented the ancient scrolls to the church. An article in the Deseret News of Salt Lake City announced the gift of 11 papyrus fragments, long believed to have been destroyed in the Chicago Fire of 1871. With the papyri was the original 1856 letter signed by the Mormon prophet's widow, Emma Smith, certifying that the documents had belonged to Joseph Smith. But did these 11 papyrus fragments include the scroll Joseph identified as a lost book of Abraham? If so, there would finally be an opportunity to vindicate his miraculous claim of discovering and translating a document from the father of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Of course, there was also the possibility of undermining that claim. The saints waited expectantly and held their breath. Joseph Smith had dictated his translation of the original papyri to his scribes in the 1830s. It was important to identify whether or not the papyri found in the 1960s were the same ones Joseph used during this process. The first clue was the most obvious. The torn picture found in one of the fragments was an identical match to the familiar picture in the beginning of the Book of Abraham. In fact, the tears on the original corresponded exactly to where the Book of Abraham drawings seem to go awry. When you have the modern state of the papyrus today in front of you today, or the photographs of it or whatever, and you compare it with the facsimile number one, you can see that where facsimile number one starts to become un-Egyptological, unexpected from an Egyptological point of view, is pretty much along the line of the present break or destruction of the papyrus. So there's every reason from that point of view to believe that the present condition of the papyrus, of the papyrus itself, is as it was in the time of Joseph Smith. If you took a painting of Madonna and Child 
and you tore off the heads of both figures and you replaced them with a dog and a cat, it would be as obvious to us now that this was wrong as the replacing of the clearly a jackal head with a human head on this Egyptian piece because we know what these images actually look like. In the same way we know that those figures would never under any circumstance hold a knife. And that's critical to the text itself because it's not merely decoration for this text. It goes to the core of the supposed story that accompanies it. And if you take the knife away, you've taken the story away as well. And clearly the knife had no reason to be there. The Book of Abraham itself mentions that this scene appeared at the commencement of the record. In other words, at the beginning of the scroll. Egyptian reads from right to left. And Joseph Smith, who was at the time studying Hebrew, which also reads from right to left, must have surmised this. It seems certain that this piece was the beginning of the scroll used by Joseph Smith. Then another discovery. A sequence of characters on a second piece of papyrus matched exactly a string of characters written in the left column of the translation manuscripts. It appeared that at Joseph's direction, his scribes copied these characters from the papyrus one by one. Joseph then dictated the meaning or translation of each one, often whole paragraphs from a single hieratic character. When Dr. Klaus Baer, professor of Egyptology at the University of Chicago, examined the papyri fragments, he determined that this same piece had at one time been attached to the piece containing facsimile one. The fibers and edges matched exactly. A third piece was found to include the name Horus, the man for whom the scroll had been prepared. And though the original facsimile three has never been found, it also mentions the name Horus. Together, these four pieces form virtually the entire scroll in its original form. Finally, scholars could meet the conditions set forth by John Henry Evans way back in 1913. No longer would the critique of the accuracy of the Book of Abraham rely on the facsimiles alone. Now, Egyptologists could read the papyri for themselves and see whether they contained an evil priest's attempt to sacrifice Abraham on an altar or an account of creation by a multiplicity of gods. In 2001, Dr. Robert Rittler, associate professor of Egyptology at the University of Chicago, was commissioned to do a complete translation of the Book of Abraham scroll. What this document really is, is an extended prayer on behalf of a deceased Egyptian priest, which begins with an invocation to the god of mummification, probably, certainly with a picture of the god of mummification to ensure his continued existence, to ensure the priest's continued existence in the next world. And then it's followed up by a series of statements where, O oh, deified Horus, may you walk as you had done on life, in life. May your ears function, may your eyes function, may the gods receive you. Long series of invocations on this, uh, essentially ensuring that this dead priest is able to function in death as he had in life, but now as part of a company of the ancient Egyptian gods. Abraham is not mentioned once. Uh, from the evidence that we have today, it's quite safe to say that Joseph Smith did not have the uh, book of Abraham or the book of Joseph in front of him in the form of these papyri because they bear no relationship to those, uh, uh, to the contents of the stories or to his translation. We wanted to get an official Mormon explanation of how the church today understands the Book of Abraham. However, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints declined our request for an interview. Michael Purdy of the church's public affairs department did refer us to this book by Mormon scholar John Gee. Dr. Gee puts forth the position that other than the original of facsimile one, the papyrus fragments given to the church in 1967 were not the portion of the papyri that contained the text of the Book of Abraham. He claims the scroll Joseph used was originally ten feet long, and that there was a large section that is now missing which may have contained the lost book. There's certainly no reason that this particular Book of Breathing scroll should be expanded much beyond the surviving length. I've now read the entire document from the beginning to the end and made out what one could make out on the 
poor copied, uh, copy of the final vignette. The most that is missing from this text is simply two columns worth of Egyptian hieratic and possibly a, vin a small vignette. But other than that, there would be nothing more that would inflate its length much beyond its current size. It is both unprecedented and unreasonable to assume that an intrusive text about a completely different matter, a narrative history of Abraham and his descendants, would have been inserted into a document whose beginning, middle, and end is devoted specifically to the resurrection of an Egyptian priest. It would disrupt the document, it would have nothing to do with its content, it would be unprecedented, and no other document would have such a thing. And the narrative style of the Book of Abraham does not correspond to Egyptian verbiage. It's not the kind of thing Egyptians would say, they wouldn't say it in that way. And it certainly would never appear in such a context as this. It couldn't possibly be more out of place. Another Mormon scholar, Michael D. Rhodes of Brigham Young University, writing in the Encyclopedia of Mormonism, argues that Joseph Smith may have received the Book of Abraham by direct revelation from God and only used the papyri to illustrate what he learned from revelation. Rhodes writes, When studying the Egyptian papyri purchased from Michael Chandler, Joseph Smith sought revelation from the Lord concerning them and received in that process the Book of Abraham. He might then have searched through the papyri in his possession to find illustrations similar to those he had learned by revelation. Nowadays, it's kind of popular to say, well, Joseph Smith didn't claim to be translating. He just saw these illustrations and then was inspired with the text of the book of Abraham. But it doesn't say in Joseph Smith's diary, kept at the time, that he was looking at the, the pictures or the illustrations and then was inspired to give a story that we now know as the Book of Abraham, but rather that he was translating these characters. This afternoon, I labored on the Egyptian alphabet in company one brothers. This afternoon, I recommenced translating from the ancient records. I returned home and spent the day in translating the Egyptian records. And in the afternoon, we translated some of the Egyptian records. The particulars of which will appear. It's, and, and it seems clear that he said, and it, it doesn't just seem clear, it, it is clear from this statement that he was making the translation from characters or hieroglyphics. Michael Rhodes of Brigham Young University also claims in the Encyclopedia of Mormonism that Joseph Smith's explanations of the facsimiles are accurate. Quote, the prophet's explanations of each of the facsimiles accord with present understanding of Egyptian religious practices. I want to be absolutely clear on this. <laughs> um, there, there, there simply is no justification for the kind of interpretations that appear in facsimile 1 or facsimile 3. They are wrong with regard to the hieroglyphs, they are wrong with regard to the gender, they are regard wrong with regard to the understanding of what the scene actually represents and where they are used in the body of the text, they are wrong there as well. In short, there is no historical validity for the interpretations in that book. None whatsoever. You cannot find outside uh, discussion of this particular set of facsimiles uh, any Egyptologist who would be discussing it in this way. But the thing about that that's, that's interesting is none of those theories in the church existed. No one ever talked about them. Nobody even thought about them until after, that is the post-November 1967 time period and where people are coming up with new explanations. When one looks at the evidence simply uh, with common sense, it becomes clear that Joseph Smith claimed that he was translating from these documents. But in fact, there's no correlation between his book of Abraham and these ancient documents. And therefore, it, it, it simply can't be a, a translation. All of the other explanations have grown up in order to sort of put the finger in the dike, as it were, to prevent the dike from breaking. But the clear evidence is that uh, Joseph Smith did not uh, translate this uh, document. It's not a document for antiquity. The Foundation for Ancient Research and Mormon Studies, FARMS, here at Brigham Young University, specializes in the defense of the Mormon scriptures. We wanted to interview their experts about the Book of Abraham, 
but they did not respond to our repeated requests for an interview. Since we couldn't get an official response from the Mormon church leadership, we went to find out how rank and file members of the church feel about the Book of Abraham today. The Book of Abraham makes no illusions that it's some kind of allegorical scripture. It clearly states that it is written um, from Abraham, by Abraham, and in the perspective of Abraham's life and times. From what I understand, the, the Book of Abraham is um, writings written by the prophet Abraham in his time, and that it was recovered by, by Joseph Smith and then later translated. That's how I interpret it. That's how I believe it to be, that Joseph Smith at, called as a prophet uh, when he was, was instructed um, to translate. Uh, and in this case, the book of Abraham were you know, direct words from Abraham translated by the prophet Joseph Smith so that we could gain knowledge from, that we didn't previously have. The book of Abraham, uh, we believe, is the story of Abraham. Again, just a few chapters, only five chapters, which, interestingly enough, although it shares some insights about Abraham, it actually is the only source in all four of the standard works that really delves into some key doctrines that become pivotal to the LDS faith. Chief of these is the concept of the preexistence and the nature of man and our relationship to God. Uh, many of these things, of course, are hinted at in other of the standard works, but I would say the Book of Abraham nails it the best and makes it the clearest and is most easily understood. I know that there is a lot of evidence both ways that can go both ways, as there is about a lot of things about cancer research. This causes cancer, this doesn't. And I know that, that it can be confusing. Um, but I think that what it boils down to is asking God for yourself and, and praying about it and studying it out, because that's what Heavenly Father wants us to do, is not merely for us to ask, but to study it out and to work and show Him that we really want to know. I don't know the history of how the Book of Mormon, I mean the Book of Abraham, uh, came into the hands of Joseph Smith. All I know is that he was, that we believe, and I believe, that he was called to be a prophet in the latter days and that if the Lord wanted him to have that information and translate it and put it into scripture for our day, then that's what he wanted him to do. Well, I think, I think you should always question. I don't think God expects us not to question. Yes, we should question and eventually, ultimately, question God, but also do our own research because, because God gave us our minds for a reason and come to some conclusions and ask him, hey, you know, I think this, am I right? And he does answer us. I know he does. So. In the end, the question persists. Does all this really matter? Should a non-Mormon have the right to question the church on issues of doctrine, or scholastic integrity? What Mormonism is trying to teach us is uh, if it were true, it's so important that we uh, check uh, the truth of those claims against the historical documents that are the basis for those claims. Central to Mormonism's religious claims uh, is the claim that Joseph Smith was a true prophet of God. If that follows, then everything he says must be true. If that falls, then nothing that he says necessarily is true. Now that the veracity of his claims about what those documents say uh, is widely questioned even within the Mormon community, uh, we have legitimate questions to raise with Mormon scholars about their new spin on what was going on with the Book of Abraham. In the face of this mountain of evidence, how are faithful Mormons to stand? How does one reconcile the words of the prophet with the evidence of history? At least for some Mormons, these discoveries raise troublesome questions. Yeah, my, my view used to be just like the regular members of the church, that this is a record of Abraham, just like it's published in the Pearl of Great Prize. And when the papyri was turned over to the church in 1967, I was pretty well uh, uh, satisfied with this is the actual papyrus that Joseph Smith uh, used. Uh, the uh, publication of it confirmed that. 
but when they started, uh, the Egyptologists started translating it, um, you get a different view. A friend of mine mentioned to me years ago, and, and I think that there's a tremendous amount of truth in this, nothing will disturb an LDS member more than finding out that Brigham Young taught the Adam God theory than having some modern Mormon apostle lie about it. And so the church really doesn't do anything, any value for their members by sanitizing the facts of the Book of Abraham. Um, I think that we are in a unique position today where we have a tremendous amount of understanding, Egyptological resources, etc., that we can go to for understanding these manuscripts. When it comes right down to it, the, the real question is, are the truth claims, the, the claims uh, that Mormons make about God, about human beings, and how a human being can be right with God, are those claims, uh, are, are those claims credible? Are they the kinds of things that we ought to be, bet our lives on? Gary and Sarah Webb live in Draper, Utah with their two young children. Both were lifelong members of the Mormon Church. Gary was heading into his senior year at BYU when he came to a life-changing conclusion. I, I even remember the spot. I, when I uh, came to the conclusion that the faith of my childhood was, was uh, untrue, um, I remember I was outside just sitting on a lawn in the summertime reading the... Uh, the book about the book of Abraham and uh, the, the evidence was so overwhelming and uh, there was really there was no place for doubt or you know that this is anti-Mormon or this is uh, you know just something somebody fudged together it was it was very clear and well documented it really became the final straw for me and I realized that I wasn't going to spend the rest of my life pretending to believe something that wasn't true and I think I, I realized that I was going to have to make some changes that were not going to be easy. That it was a really difficult time for us and uh, but we've we've uh, gotten past the anger and you know into discovering more about the truth instead of uh, lies that we were stuck in for a while. While Gary and Sarah have left the Mormon church, they have not left faith altogether. Yeah, Sarah and I have some friends who uh, have left the LDS church and have basically given up any faith that they have at all in any kind of belief in God. And uh, that's kind of sad for us because, although it's easy to understand because uh, once you put your faith and trust in something for so long and then you find out that uh, you know that you were your beliefs were are not verified uh, but rather that they're that they're unfounded um, it, it can make it difficult to trust again um, and that's that's kind of like throwing out the baby with the bathwater and in, in saying well if uh, the LDS church isn't true then then you know the Bible isn't true and there's no Jesus Christ and no God and um, all these things are uh, uh, not one and the same. So, in 1835, Joseph Smith purchased scrolls from Michael H. Chandler. At the time, no one knew what those mysterious ancient Egyptian scrolls actually were. No one in America could read the text or had seen anything of the sort before. But Joseph Smith claimed that he could read them, that he could translate them. I have commenced the translation of some of the characters or hieroglyphics, and much to our joy, have found that one of the rolls contained the writings of Abraham. One of the rolls contained the writings of Abraham. Contained the writings of Abraham. The evidence against the authenticity of the Book of Abraham cannot help but raise questions about Joseph Smith's other translations, such as the more foundational Book of Mormon. For some, since Joseph's translation of the book of Abraham, which can be tested, has been found to lack credibility, then how can we accept his translation of the book of Mormon, which cannot be tested? Scholars have never had the opportunity to examine those originals. And since the gold plates were returned to the angel Moroni, apparently 
They never will. Thank you.